what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Forecast, a golf podcast on the Mesh Podcast Network. We will make you think, make you laugh, and grow your golf IQ. We are your connection to the who's who in the game of golf. Our goal is to make you a better golfer and a better lover of the game. I'm your host, Alan Burton, and I want to thank all my listeners for coming on and joining us today. Uh, I have a fantastic guest, and I'm so honored that he took time out to spend a little time with us. I have uh, today Dr. Brett McCabe. He is the founder of The Mindside and a licensed clinical psychologist, holds a Ph.D. degree in clinical psychology from Louisville, uh, excuse me, Louisiana State University, LSU, wearing the purple very proudly, I'm sure, today. Um, he's been, uh, quite honestly, one of the, the best mental mentors to me in the last several years since I've met Dr. Brett McCabe. I think it's probably 10 or, or so years ago now. We met at a Aimpoint conference at Kasik in uh, Kiowa, South Carolina, I think it was, Dr. And um, you were uh, very early into the golf industry, I think, at that time. But you have really, really done some amazing things for our sport and continue to work with PGA and LPGA tour players as well as NFL, NBA, and MMA. Uh, so you, you're uh, getting around at this stage in your career uh, quite a bit. And we're very, very happy to have you with us, Dr. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I, the way I look at it is um, – you know, performance is, is the competitive environment that we, that we all work in and whatever you do, whether you're in golf or you're a businessman or businesswoman who wants to play better golf or wants to do better in their game, the competitive skills of what it takes, there's not much differences between the sports or the environments. It's ultimately comes down to the way that we think and how we prepare and and how we execute. Well, I totally agree. And, and winning is the goal. And, and no matter what you're trying to do, you're trying to be successful. I always think of uh, John Wooden saying, you know, if you're planning to if you uh, fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And so often that's the case for those athletes out there, isn't it? It is. I mean, I think I, I think there's four major pillars of the mental game. And I think it's important for people to understand that a lot of times what we do with the mental game is that we're we've got it on the loan, meaning we don't do the things necessarily to grow our belief in ourselves or to believe, to grow the consistency of our performance. So in the heat of the moment, we're on loan. We're, we're not built on a foundation of our success. We're not built on a foundation of uh, things to really, you know, know how we're going to perform in the heat of the moment. Every new scenario is unique and different. It's always uncertain, but what shouldn't change is who we are in the competitive environment. Um, we got to learn that we can, we can meet that demand based on bringing the skills and the mindset that we have in the heat of the moment. So players will call me all the time and they'll say, God, I can't believe that I played bad there. I mean, it's, and instead of seeing it, God, I played bad. It's what do I need to learn from this? That doesn't mean that I like you to fail. It doesn't mean that I want you to have this rosy picture. It's the fact that competitiveness takes everything out of who you are. It requires you to be fully invested. So if you understand the four pillars, which are, a disciplined preparation plan. In other words, having a plan of what you need to do to execute in order to meet the uncertainty in front of you. You, you put a plan in place, you execute it. Most people get motivated to put a plan together. They work on it for a week and then they abandon it because it's hard to be disciplined in your preparation. But the best athletes, the best teams I work with, the Alabama Crimson Tide football team or the other sports that Alabama I work with, um, the you know Florida State golf programs I work with, they put together game plans because they have coaches that establish what needs to be done. Chick-fil-A is not great because they just have a great logo and a great brand. They're great because they are prepared to be great every day. Disney World is great be- versus Six Flags because Six Flags is pretty good. Disney World is exceptional because every scenario that you're in with Disney demonstrates the preparation plan that they have in order to be great. The second pillar is that you got to have relentless execution. You got to know who you are, the personality you are. You got to know how to evaluate pressure in the heat of the moment. You've got to be willing to fight and put yourself in the heat of the moment in order to perform at your best. 
And that is a learning process, not a birthright process. You are not born to be great in the heat of the moment. You learn to be great in the heat of the moment. Third, you have to know what your, you got to develop your resiliency. You got to develop what it takes to keep coming back uh, in the heat of the moment. Um, The Navy SEALs have a bell that they drive around in buds and they, you have to ring the bell to leave. And the reason for that is when it gets hard, you have to make the conscious choice to ring the bell or to stay in it. And that's what life is. That's what a round of golf is. That's what competition is, is that it's a constant question of, are you going to stay in it? Are you going to quit on yourself or quit on the experience? And then the last pillar is developing you as a person. And that, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us try to, a lot of us feel really good when we perform well because we feel this increased sense of value. And a lot of us feel bad when we play poorly because we lose that value of ourselves. And that's where we're failing on ourselves. Everything we do is an expression of who we are and who we are as a person, as a, as a, as an individual, as a living, breathing organism. And every experience, every mentor, every person we put around our life is a chance to learn who we are at a better, a better manner. We have to have that same personality when we're out there competing. And if we don't, then we're going to fail. So if you understand those four pillars of the mental game, regardless of what you're doing, you can be successful. But the fact is most of us will fail on the very first one on the preparation plan because we won't hold ourselves accountable to what it takes to be great. And we'll go out there when we get into execution phase and, and leverage or hope that it holds true. And it simply can't. Totally, totally understand. I I work with golfers every day. And as you know, I I deal with a wide variety of, of skill level players. I certainly have a few youngsters that are out there trying to play golf for a living that I work with college players, high school golfers, recreational players at all levels and and I find it interesting that the majority of them when they come to me for their their first visit as a player they they're they're typically troubled they're not playing well that the reason they've seeked out help and and advice from a coach is that they're struggling in some capacity and very few of them have a journal they have nothing to uh, indicate where they've been what they've worked on the things that they're trying to do and it's, it's just evidence that there's never been any awareness uh, of, of that structure that they need. Uh, and they wonder where their confidence is, is coming from if they have nothing to base it on. You know, So I've always encouraged my players to have a journal, to write things down, things that are successful, things that you do day to day. Just a simple way uh, to track their progress and understand when they're, when they're getting results, what, it, what they're doing to get those results. Would you think that's a good idea to... Yeah, we have, um, I have what's called the elite journal, um, in my office and I put it together years ago. I had a, a couple of players I was working with when I first started doing this, and, you know, as psychologists, we're really big into journaling and understanding who we are and the, the, but I never really did it. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't hold people accountable to it. And, and I found that what happened was without that anchor, what, what, the mind does is it uh, it takes the moment and our emotional response to the moment and that allows us to create our perspective well that's flawed because if i wake up this morning and i look outside and it's raining and it's been raining for two days and i you know i'm carrying my bags down to go to the airport later today i got a cup of coffee in my hand Um, i've got way too many things and i spill coffee on my shirt all right, now, oh, man, now I'm ticked. I'm already ticked because I'm running late because I should have gotten up a little bit earlier, but it felt good to lay in bed. And then I'm rushing to get to work and I'm already running late for my call. And now I get in and I drop some of my papers out in the rain. I'm going to look at my day as not being very good immediately, despite the fact that I probably contributed to that more than the actual circumstances did. And to make matters worse, now, I'm going to continue to see my struggles and I'm going to see the areas where, um, you know, it's going to be a harder day because, you know, if I got to run errands or I got to look at the, my flight may be delayed. My impression of the moment is going to be that it's not very good. But if I could take a, take a snapshot of where I'm at and go, wait a minute here, it's raining. So what? Just got to make sure I have an umbrella and I got to take two extra trips to the car instead of trying to do everything at one time. And I need to give myself a little extra time to get to the airport. I'm now much better in a frame of mind to meet that challenge. Well, 
we unfortunately don't have that rational mindset, particularly in competitive environments, because we assign so much value to outcomes to our psyche. So what happens is if you're not taking notes and not journaling where you're doing well, areas that you struggled, how you're going to improve and give yourself that snapshot, then you allow the moment like today where it's raining to be the definition that you suck and that you're falling short. And it's always a struggle versus going, wait a minute here, man, it's, it's going to be gorgeous the next four days. And Mm -hmm. it's, it was pretty this past weekend. It's just raining today. Sure. Well, a a PGA tour player wins 80% of their money in five events a year. So they're going to play on average 25 events a year, and they're going to make 80% of their money in five of those events. The best players in the world will follow the same, the same formula. It's if you're in business, you know, it's the 80, 20 rule, but it holds true in golf. So if the best players in the world that are playing with the best equipment that have the best efficient swings for them that have, play on the best surfaces and are playing on the biggest stage are only making 80% of their money in five events a year. Why in the hell do you think you're different that you should play great every week because it's what you want? Okay. <laughs> it is really, really hard to play this game. The journey towards success is extremely hard. Whatever success we want, it is brutal. And if we don't learn to, for the, to be resilient along that path, to stay in the fight and realize that it's not personal. It's simply not personal. It's not. Yeah. Has okay? nothing to do with that. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. It's just the fact that it's hard. Yesterday, my wife and I were watching on TV. My wife is, my, my youngest daughter is going to college this year. So our flexibility and freedom in our household has just picked up quite a bit. <laughs> and my wife loves to exercise. She hasn't been doing it lately. And so she's like, you know, we we're watching TV and they had one of these Spartan races on. Yeah. Which looks like total stupidity to me, but that's a whole other point. But she's like, that is the coolest thing I've watched. And I'm like, but you would go out in the rain in the mud and get your, she goes, yeah, that'd be fun. I'm like you don't even do that at home. But, but to her, that became the challenge. Like she goes, I'm built for that. Yeah. Like that, that, that makes me interested. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> interesting that she sees that as why don't we look at everything that way? Sure. That's the way Tom Watson looked at it in, in the Open Championships, I'm sure. Hey, it's going to rain. So what? I love it. it. It eliminates a big percentage of the field. You know, so. Absolutely. you got to look what your angle is and your advantage is. You know, this stuff, this game is so freaking hard. And life is too. If, if, they, if people really told us how hard it was, okay, <laughs> nobody would ever do it. Right. Nobody right. would ever do it. Nobody right. would ever tell you to be a teacher. Nobody would ever tell you to, to sacrifice everything you have to go out on your own. Like I tell my, I just had a player in my office and we were having this conversation and it, it was kind of funny when he laughed when I said it. I said, you guys are all playing for two years exemptions, right? Yeah, yeah, I need the security. I said, what security do I have? <laughs> I don't have two years security in any contract. I don't have one contract with, with a tour player, a school, a business or anything. I have no right. contract. <laughs> because I'd never hold somebody if they wanted to fire me. Right. You know, right. I have no security. All I can do is give you the best I got every day. That, that's exactly right. You know, I, I feel like a lot of the time we're managing the expectation levels of our players. And generally speaking, I refer to it as the frustration gap. I may have shared this with you at a trade show for, uh, over the, the last few, few years. But I think it's expectations that are way too high, preparation that is way too low, and the gap between those two is the frustration gap of the player. And we've got to lower those expectations to something that's attainable, something that's realistic and achievable. Um, you know, example would be I have a, a college player on the putting green, and they're frustrated because they haven't made any 10-foot putts in their last four rounds of competitive golf. And I say, well, hey, look, you had, let's say you had a perfect ball striking day where you had 10 looks at birdie from 10 feet. How many do you think you're supposed to make? And they say eight out of 10. And I just – well, did you know the PGA Tour average statistic is maybe 41% from 10 feet? And you're expecting to double that. And I say, well, how, how many hours a week do you spend practicing your putting? And most of the time they'll say, well, I spent two hours last week. And I say, well, 6 to 12 is the average for a PGA Tour player. And then I heard Jason Day's caddy mention that maybe some weeks, 20 hours a week spent on putting. So, yeah. you know, the expectations are just yeah, too high. And it's also – and look, I, even my tour players struggle with this. And, and this doesn't mean that they're bad or wrong or anything like that. Is that 
you know, if you want to be the best at what you want to do, you got to do the things that uncommon people, you got to do the uncommon things that common people don't do. Correct. Okay. If I want to be the best at business, everyone knocks on Nick Saban for being hard to coach for. <laughs> he doesn't care. <laughs> right. He doesn't care. Um, you know, our generation today wants security and safety everywhere. They want everybody to be nice to them. Like I had a, a lady who worked for me who was awesome. She was fantastic. And I felt bad from a business standpoint that I wasn't a better manager and owner for her. But really what happened was, too, she came to me and said, look, I got a better opportunity to do something more in line with what I love to do. And then she's like, and it's a more fun environment. And I said, and that one hurt me because I was like, more fun environment. <laughs> well, when I looked at the job description, they said that every Friday they, they have um, cupcake day. It oh. literally said that in the job interview. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the problem that we have today from a coaching standpoint is that many of our players were raised on the Barney generation where it's all going to be fair. It's everybody's going to be okay. And everybody's going to get equal opportunity. Right. Listen, here that's are my four tenets. Is. Life ain't fair. Okay? <laughs> good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. And coaches play favorites. Absolutely. And, if, and so if you can understand that you have the opportunity to create something for yourself. Okay. It's just like, you know, as you're talking about with putting, right? Okay. You got to do the uncommon things that the common person won't do. And you've got to go out there and, and work and train and put yourself in a frame of mind that when you leave practice, did you putt because it's what you're supposed to do? Or did you put yourself through a grinder of putting because you wanted to be the best putter in the planet? Right. Okay? Well, if you're going to want to be the best putter on the planet, if I, my, daughter, my daughter came to us and, and she's got a jewelry business and she's graduated Auburn and she's doing great. And she's, I want to start this business and, and, and run it full time. I said, no, you're going to go get a master's in digital media because that's what she was interested in. And then you're going to go work for a buddy of mine for three years. And Good. if you can't find a job, then I will, make, I will get somebody to hire you. But you're going to learn what it's like to be trained, to be coached. Like, I need you to be there after your boss leaves in the day. I need you to, to work at home on something and fight for it, not put, you know, cash a check and punch a clock. I need you to have a report that's due on Monday and a presentation due on Tuesday and learn how to manage those things. Sure. Okay. Our kids are, and I say kids, anybody who's on the competitive environment who just wants to go about doing it the same way should go research Kobe Bryant and figure out what it took for him to be great. Go research what it takes to work for some of these great business leaders. You know, people rip on Sheryl Sandberg because she's tough to work for for Google or oh. for Facebook. Well, sorry. She built pretty much Google. She's taken Facebook to a whole new level. It's not easy to work for the best, but it makes great people. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think where, where most people coming out of college today, they think that diploma is going to guarantee them a $65,000 and up job. And it's, it's just not the way it works. You know, no. I, I, I found it challenging to find young uh, entrepreneurial spirited individuals that want to learn how to teach golf and assist me in what I do. And it's, it's a fantastic career. I, I really am uh, pleased and proud of what I've been able to do in a very small market area here in Hickory, North Carolina. Um, but finding someone to assist and come to this small climate that wants to work and develop a clientele, it, it just doesn't seem to be the, the mindset of the youngster today. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's because they've been sold a bill of goods by agencies that grant degrees, universities that grant degrees and, and things. And I know this sounds cynical, um, but we got to remember who's often teaching these classes are people that have jobs to tell them what the future, what the world looks like, but aren't in the world. OK, they're they're like travel agents that tell you how great your vacation in Hawaii is going to be. And they've never been there. OK, they got the brochure. They learned about it and they know it. OK. And I'm not saying a teacher needs to be a great player because some people learn to teach because they suck as a player, okay? But if you want to be a great teacher and you want to learn what it takes to be a coach, and you want, then you need to invest your time, uh, sometimes free, and work hours upon hours of screwing people up with the right intention, okay? Doesn't mean that you want to screw them up, but it just means that it may happen, sure. okay? And you also have to look at it and go, how, what did I get better? What did I, when so-and-so fired me, what did I do to get better because of that? They gave me a blessing that they fired me as a coach. Okay. What do I need to do? Like players, 
coaches don't go watch other coaches teach enough. They rather critique what their comments are on social media, why they have no social media game. Correct. Okay. You've got to be willing to put your ass on the line in competition and teaching and business. And if you're not, then punch a clock. And that's fine. It's okay to be a punch clock, a clock puncher. Okay. Then don't bitch that you don't have what you don't want. You know, you want to be on the PGA tour if you're a mini tour player. Well, then go get on a tour. Don't live at home every day and go play a mini tour event against the same 15 guys and think that that's going to get you ready for the U.S. Open. Exactly. It doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, I think where a lot of players come from that mindset, they get out there and they find out that, look, I shot I have a, a young player that I coach. He shot 65 in three consecutive Monday qualifiers. He got in one event. Two of them were web events. One of them was a PGA Tour event, and the 65 got him into the PGA Tour event. Uh, it did not get him into the web event. So yeah. I mean, he's shooting 65 and not getting it done. I mean, what do you tell a young player who's shooting those kind of scores on Monday? Um, and it's not getting him where he wants to go. You know, what do you tell that player? The same thing I tell the people who have a tremendous product that sit in the lobby of a business and are selling their product to the business and the business chooses their competitor. It's nothing personal. It's just the fact that, um, you know, you are giving it everything you got And sometimes it's good enough and sometimes it's not, but you have to learn what you can do to be better. And sometimes it's the fact that what it takes to get better is to take a 65 pack up my car and go to the next one, believing that I'm putting myself in position. There's no guarantee that you put yourself in position. It's going to work. Okay. You know, we, this game and, and, and life itself is about the endurance, not the arrival. And, and when we watch the PGA Tour, we, we use guys like Justin Thomas, Jordan Spee, Xander Shoffley, John Rahm as the standard. We don't use guys like Joe, Joel Damon as the, or Damon as the standard. Correct. We don't use guys like Scott Stallings as the standard. We don't use guys like Patton Kazire, who spent six years on the mini tours as the standard. Correct. They are the standard. The other guys – are fast arrivers. They've got to learn. They've got a different challenge. They got to learn how to stay there. Exactly. And That's you need to be great. Yeah, Jordan Spieth's obviously learning some of the challenges in staying there, staying great from his season in 2015 till now. You know, what do you think happens in a player's world that gets them a little bit off track? Yeah. Well, things change. I mean, you know, expectations change. You know, guys, the 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 motivation to get you there is and to get you working is never the motivation that keeps you there. Okay. Um, I, I, I sent a player an example a couple of months ago and I said, um, you know, he's a big outdoorsman and loves to be on the water. And I said, it's like when you get in that boat and you you get out of the no wake zone and you hit the throttle and the butt of the, and the, the ass of the boat drops deep in the water and starts turning up all the under, under stuff. And it's creating a big grind and it's moving the engines open and the throttles firing and it's the, the no, nose is pointed up and it's grinding. And then over the next X amount of time, you know, yards, whatever, it starts to get up on plane. You, you raise the trim, and now it doesn't require as much effort to push. It's now skimming across the top, and it's cutting. And if I killed the engine, that boat's still going to cruise for a while, okay? And I'm still going to believe I'm doing great things because of the work I did when I was leaving the marina. But eventually, I'm going to lose momentum. And if I just hit the accelerator again, if I hit the throttle again with the trim up, it's just going to spin a lot of water up on top. And I'm not, I'm going to put a lot of effort and not get a lot of return. Okay. Not many people want to drop their ass back in the water and get after it. Right. That's what you got to do when it's hard. Right. No, I totally, I totally get that. That's a great analogy. You know, so many, uh, I give an example of a young player I coach who, who fell in love with the fitness element. He got into the gym, spent a lot of time there, and uh, he saw immediate results. His efforts in the gym put the immediate results in front of the mirror. Um, his golf uh, kind of went the other way, and he, he, I guess, got frustrated with the process of working on his golf because he wasn't seeing that immediate result from that work. That's so difficult to do in the sport, isn't it, doctor? Well, ask them ask this. This is what I tell players about the mental game. Is, 
is the mental game is like doing deadlifts in the gym. Right? I don't know when a deadlift is going to show up on a golf course. Okay? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know when you're going to ever have a moment where you have to lift your bag off the ground with slightly bent knees with perfect form. <laughs> right? yeah. But I do know that you do that to secure the foundation. And you do deadlifts so that there's a day where you've got a little bit of a side hill lie and your body's a little fatigued. And when you get your posture over the ball, it's going to be really critical for you to execute this golf shot to maintain your posture. And because of those deadlifts, your posture was able to be maintained. And you hit this shot and it comes out in your window and it goes up on the green. Nobody really knows how difficult that shot was. And you may not even know in the moment because you maintain your posture. But your mind never goes, God, thank God I did those deadlifts back in January. <laughs> right. So, but what you do is you go, man, I pulled off a great shot. Those are the contributions and the investments that we have to make in ourselves so that when we need to take the withdrawal and pull off of what we need, we have what it takes to be successful. Anything short of that, okay, we're leveraging on hope. Hope is a terrible strategy for success. It was a terrible promise made to the American public that we're going to hope for a better future. No, you work your ass off to make a better future and you use the circumstances that are in your life to become better because of it. Absolutely. It's earned, isn't it, doctor? It's earned. It, 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 it's, it's earned, but it's also earned every day. Yep. I, I think it's like the serenity prayer in a lot of ways. I mean, if you, if you're, um, familiar with the serenity prayer, I tell my oh, players, yeah. I say, this This is a really good analogy of what I think golf is. You know, serenity prayer says, Dear Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so making skills better, skills that are weak, uh, good assessment of those skills and where you're weak, can you develop a plan to improve those and then can you understand the difference between those factors that you can't control, the weather, the timing of, a, of a, uh, a trip that you missed a plane, and all the things that happen from uh, things that you can't control in the weather, uh, injuries, things of that nature that you just, beyond your control, how long is it going to take you to recover from an injury? Some of these things you can control to Absolutely. a degree, but you, you can't control every piece of it. But do you know the second half of that prayer? I do not. All right, you ready for this? It it gets a little bit more spiritual, so here we'll go. So the first part is, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Correct. The second is this, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did in this sinful world, as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. Amen. What that actually says is that it's going to be hard. It's going to be brutal. Okay. That I'm going to give up the, I'm going to give up the fight on the things I can't control, but I'm going to learn to take joy out of each experience, understanding that the journey is about the path of obstacles and not the path of beauty and the path of precision. It's about pushing and that's what we got to look at is we believe in our mind because we hope to not have to struggle. We hope to not have to hurt. We hope not to have to worry. And the reality is we are supremely prepared for each of those. Fantastic. Well, doctor, that brings us to a close of today's conversation. I think that is fantastic wisdom for us to take to the golf course and, and try to be a better golfer, better person, and uh, and manage ourselves in, in a way of uh, improvement. So those are some fantastic directions. I want to encourage you as a listener to seek out Dr. Brett McCabe. Uh, again, the founder of The Mind Side. He's written many publications. He's a coach. He's a mentor. He can lead you down that path of success. Seek him out on all mediums. His website will make all these available to you here. And again, thanks for listening today on The Forecast. I'm, I'm your host, Alan Burton. And again, thanks to Dr. Brett McCabe for joining us today and spending a little time and sharing his knowledge in the mind side of golf. Thanks again. Thank you, sir. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.